today to our guest Clifford W De Silva the secret life of Clifford W De Silva editor psychologist and much more Clifford uh, Clifford's claim to fame claims to fame are many fold so he has been an editor of one book as he shared with me recently he has been a author of two books and he's also been a co-author of other books which he doesn't want to mention which we'll ask him about later apart from that he practices psychology and he runs the goa institute of correct me with the name goa institute of counseling counseling at navedi so clifford we are talking to you at navedi right at the moment yes yep fine fine and uh, he's he's been he's been a jesuit for some time uh, in the uh, he was uh, studying to become a jesuit and he's also edited this very interesting book on the on on a biography on the life of uh, anthony de mello more about that later clifford tell us your story tell us about your books to start with okay this uh, i was a good friend of, of tony de mello and uh, he was pretty well known in many parts of the world especially united states but also south america and other places because he had done his philosophy in spain and he told me how he began he gave something in spain a, a program in spain and he had a translator he said but by the by the end of the first morning he had got back his spanish so then since he was also familiar with spanish he got called to many south american countries before we get into the details sorry yeah. for the interruption yeah yeah so, see so anthony anthony de mello was this prominent uh, jesuit of goan origin who was famed for his retreats in the us and a powerful speaker at that uh, he passed away quite suddenly uh, he his uh, his views were a little bit unorthodox if we could say to use a mild word a little bit controversial also but an amazing man and uh, tony will carry on with his story sorry i mean uh, cliff will carry on with his story yeah so how i got into editing was i happened to see a website that was written by his brother bill and i messaged him that i know his brother and so on but he never responded to that and many many years later i happened to come across that website again and i contacted him and he told me that he had never received my message to him earlier and then he told me he is writing this or attempting to write this uh, the biography of his brother and he asked me if i'd like to get involved and of course i said yes then i can't hear you could, could you give us an introduction to anthony de mello first okay uh Anthony de Mello was a priest who rose to fame uh, somewhere in late in the late 60s. I met him in 1971 after I had finished my novitiate and junior year and had gone to Bombay to learn Marathi language and he was the rector of that place. But prior to that he had been to Spain for his uh, philosophy and he had been to America to learn uh, To, he was at Loyola University to learn counseling and spirituality, and he came. He was at that time quite famous for his long retreat, the you know the Jesuit long retreat, the Ignatian long retreat. He was also coming up as a, a you know he had he had different ideas. The this was after Vatican II, but there were things that were very closed still. you know like in the society they had like uh, something called particular friendship you could not have a particular friendship you could not have a special friend <laughs> would you believe it uh, they also had the rule of touch where you never touched anybody ever you know except under appropriate like a handshake or there would be the amplexus when you embrace someone like usually priests when the priest at the priest ordination you still see that amplexus you know so he was beginning to think of how he could he found that people were very stuck so how could he make uh, spirituality a little bit 
more let's say palatable all those Fine. rules and so 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 if anyone has just joined us clifford de silva is introducing us to his friend and his senior uh, anthony de mello who was a young jesuit in the 70s and uh, the context is this catholic church which is post vatican council 2 but is still quite conservative and still quite uh, reticent about what it allows what it doesn't allow and uh, clifford is just encountering anthony who later on passes away and uh, whose book uh, whose work clifford edits but we are running ahead of a story so i'll give it over to clifford to introduce anthony better he is of goan origin but very little known back home right yeah carry on carry on yeah so actually it was not the society was still a little bit conservative but a lot of things had opened up okay priests were allowed to leave for example and you know there were even bishops and cardinals and all leaving at that time that is quite common provincials in the society of jesus were leaving but that's not the point the point is that he was looking he was always a spiritual spirituality person how to make spirituality available to all basically enlightenment so he was always searching that he was famous for his uh, already famous for his ignatian retreats even when i met him he was like he used to be called to hong kong or uh, united states to give give a, a retreat maybe a three day retreat maybe an eight day retreat and once or twice a long retreat also but he had this idea of forming something called sadhana which still exists now but sadhana initially started as it was a spirituality center the sound is coming perfect so there's no uh, okay i close my you know my mail and stuff like that it's yeah now it's sounding perfect so if you can uh -huh. just uh, restart from the portion where you were mentioning his involvement with sadhana and relation sadhana okay yeah so you can see the idea of sadhana maybe about the time when he was the rector of of uh, vinayal yeah? and in 72 he did he laid the groundwork for it 73 he began the first batch consisted of uh, uh, a small group of about 15 or 16 people and i think they were also one or two nuns maybe in, maybe in the next batch but the, these are people selected you know they were already rich rich preachers and so on but what was different was uh, he was into much into gestalt psychology so he was using gestalt therapy a lot to help people get over their personal problems you know hang ups unfinished business that we say in gestalt therapy and stuff like that but it it was, it was essentially a spirituality uh, program mixed with a lot of you know taking advantage of all therapy that is available he was himself just getting familiar with uh, gestalt therapy he never did any course or anything in america he had must have studied person centered therapy and um, this he was reading on his own and working it out experimenting he would experiment with all of us and so on and then he was obviously brilliant because he had got the thing in fact i attended in 73 of may a 10 day kind of a program where every morning we would have whole morning would have this group dynamics kind of thing from gestalt therapy which was an amazing experience for me explain and gestalt therapy explain gestalt therapy gestalt yeah, therapy indeed. was founded by uh, frederick pearls he had a lot of eastern background i think he was a german jew who came to america during the before the war second world war and uh, it was different from psycho uh, you know psychoanalysis because he never delved much into the past and so on he dealt with the present that's why is known as one of the existential therapies you know there's Uh, the humanistic, which Carl Rogers and existential, they usually humanistic stroke existential therapies. So I'll give you an example of how he would solve problems. A man who came to him, violinist, didn't play after an hour or so. He couldn't play. He was a concert violinist, and he didn't go into. You know, a psychoanalyst would go into a lot of. Yeah, he would go into a lot of. Uh, theory background childhood some complex and so on he just told him to bring his violin and play it and when he was playing it he just moved his elbow a little bit in like that and said carry on and that problem had stopped so sometimes it was like a simple solution he would just uh, uh, work on your feelings 
rather than go into a lot of theory and complex and what you know childhood and so on and so forth what are you feeling right now work with that and okay. he had something interesting called the empty chair therapy you would you would get you to speak to the person you had a problem with in an empty chair in front of you and then go and be the other person it, it gets too technical to explain that but he was doing a lot of that tony was doing a lot of this with this group okay then later yeah. he was uh, i left the society in 1979 and i never met him again till 19 in 1986 he died and never met him after 1979 uh but we were always in touch through through letters and so on in those days there was you know not even phone calls i didn't have a phone i was in the queue for 7 years for a landline you know uh but we we corresponded and then he died suddenly in america on on the day before he was to give a a program there but he had already given one which he called awareness which was made into a book and his 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 videos and tapes are to be found online uh freely i think and then you all edited YouTube. this book you edited this book ah, written so by his, his brother. brother got involved with this so his brother got me involved with the book and uh after we had done it uh he sent it to some people in america and that person said you know what uh she, this lady was ready to get it done but she said this book would have to be edited and that would have been about to edit somebody just to edit the book was charging something like Five thousand dollars or something like that. I don't remember the figures. So Bill asked me whether I would edit it. So I thought, what's the big deal about editing it? We had done it anyway. I had done the editing. It's just that now this lady wanted to edit it further. So we said, let's get it done in Vilas Gujarat Sahitya Prakash after I edited it, whether they would accept it, and they did. <coughs> what I did was not a great thing. What I did was there was all these stories from various people that Bill had collected. we had to put into some semblance of order that's all so we made the chapter some chapters were too large i divided them to two we got some chronology in and we got special chapters done only towards his spirituality then tony de mello as a person what was he like so that was basically it i mean what else is writing a biography is pretty easy when we had that much of material from people and there was enough he had we had enough of his companions who were alive who could give us information so that was it but he's an amazing person in the sense that uh, he wrote a lot he preached a lot his uh, his uh, his retreats were highly valued even in the us which which of course is a mark of uh, acceptance today for us also <laughs> unfortunately yes and uh, yeah his books his books were amazing i have before me just one of his many books and sad to say that uh, you know we we came to know of him only after his death and his passing mm. and things like that the prayer of a frog and uh, would you think that goa recognizes his legacy and understands him at all i wouldn't know and i'm not really interested and i don't think he would goa. be either why 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 propagate him the book even the book you said you know you said sad that he we saw him met him only after we found his book only after he left what difference would it have made if he were alive what difference would i made yeah. to you no my issue is that we goa is a society which values its people once they are 6 feet under so i have a problem with that <laughs> anyway anyway your question is valid also your question is also valid yeah because see what is more important is you know i met somebody who says Is there any other book of Tony De Mello that you have or that you know of which I have not read? I said, why do you want to read so many books? It's important that you get. You know, you're looking for enlightenment. Enlightenment is important. Enlightenment is important, not the book. Burn the so book. Saying, One of his stories saying, he has this. Once you've done with it, burn the book. I don't know if you heard the name of that. Consumerist. Have you we have you heard that? Consumerist. Heard of a sorry. You are saying we should not be consumerist even in our search for enlightenment, especially in our search for enlightenment. See, being enlightened doesn't mean that you you know you're just you're the same. You're not anything different if you're an enlightened person. You know the enlightened person was asked, "How was it? How was life before enlightenment?" He said, "I sing, I draw water from the well, I chop wood." And they said, "After enlightenment, he said, I sing, I draw water from the well, I chop wood." 
There's just a difference inside. So, so he had all these short stories and parables through which he would make his point, right? Yeah, so and he, I believe that very strongly. That's why the book I wrote, Not a Serpent, Not a Rope, I went further than him. I just gave the story. I said, I'm not going to give a moral. You're spoiling it by giving a moral because the story can be read in any way by any person at any time. It may he he or she might get the 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 point of that story maybe after five years. I myself have got the yeah. point of a story after a long, many years or many months. Why do I, I? Who am I? Who am I to? Why should I chew it and give it to you I, and put it in your mouth? I don't intend to rake up controversy here, but we journalists love sometimes a good fight. And uh, what I'm trying to understand is what caused this dispute between him and the Vatican. Uh, was it uh-huh. uh, his dabbling? His dabbling with uh, with uh, other religions and Buddhism in particular, and trying to. I mean, today today we may be more tolerant and more acceptant accepting accepting of it. But uh, what 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 like sparked off the trouble then? And the funny thing is that all this was discovered about five or ten years after he died. You know, right. the wheels of the Vatican, they move. They grind slow, but they grind exceedingly fine, as they say. So they found some of the things that he said objectionable, because it's like, in some cases, he was. It was almost like he was saying that, say, Christ is not the only way to, to God, or other other things are more are also equally important. So he, maybe they felt he was irreverent about the Catholic Church or whatever. So. Because one of the things they said is that it would lead people away from God. And I found that I found people like uh, there's a lady who came, uh, Tamara Crane. She came to, to interview me as one of person known to Tony. And she, Tony. she's an, a deeply spiritual person. But, you know, there's a difference between being spiritual and being religious. Like she's not Christian or she doesn't attend church or anything. But there were people like this from all walks of life who, would, who definitely came closer to 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 God. I guess I guess which what you make of Christianity also depends on which part of the world you are in. So in a multi multi religious uh, you know multi faith context like Asia, the way we see Christianity would be very different anyway. But but that's just an opinion. And uh, no no yeah. there was an Indian theology I can't get his name I think Father Samuel Ryan. And he straight away said, you know, that the Vatican and the West, the West, they are suspicious of Eastern philosophy. Hmm. Uh, Yeah, now it's better. Now it's better. I I think there was a bit of a glitch with the sound. Uh, If you can just make a point again about the suspicion towards the Eastern uh, approaches or... Asian. About Samuel Ryan. Samuel yeah. Ryan said that in general, the West is a little suspicious of Eastern philosophy and Eastern spirituality. So I think a lot of people came closer to God as a result of Tony DeMello. In fact, I wanted to write a kind of a rejoinder and I thought it makes no difference. Tony must be laughing all the way, you know, to uh, whichever chamber he is in heaven and thinking, ha ha ha, Clifford. Just see what they've done. They've actually banned me. He would be thrilled about it. Because it, Tony is not important. His books are not important. You know, important thing is for you to find your your source. Like he used to say, I'm dancing my dance. Whether you pick it up, whether you understand, it's I'm doing my thing. In that sense, it's very much like the Gestalt prayer. You know? I do my thing, you do your thing. I'm not in this world to live up to your expectations. What some, yeah, conservatives, that what some conservatives might call uh, relativism, relativism and uh, and something which is not desirable. But anyway, that's a different mm. debate. That's that's a different debate. Uh, you also having... did your BPH, uh, Bachelor of Philosophy, because <laughs> no, no, you I sound didn't. like you sound most, like my professors in philosophy. Most people suspect, but I didn't. I I, I didn't enter yeah. a seminary. I wanted to, but that's a different story altogether, and we'll go off on a different tangent. Uh, mm-hmm. Having said that, uh, of course, the the interesting thing is that I keep finding Tony's books all over the place. I'm an avid collector of Goa books. You can't see them because it's uh, it's 
hidden this way. I've got like three thousand books related to Goa. Don't ask me why I'm so regionalistic. But I love mm. collecting books by Goans and uh, Goan authors. And Do you have this one? I think I yeah, sent course. you a copy. Of course, of course. Hold it it's, a bit it's before probably the camera. somewhere in your library. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is very much yeah. there. And and not only that, I've picked up a lot of Tony De Mello's books uh, at at second hand sales, and I collect them with a lot of avidness. You know, even if there's more than one copy, I'll make sure I keep them because here's mm. an interesting guy. I mean, he may not be known in the land of his ancestors or whatever. But uh, he's someone who has who really made us think a lot. So you edited this book. You edited this book, and uh, that's the book which you are showing us. I'll yeah. do a small screen share so that uh, is it still available online or or what? How? That's how it. I think it's out of print. I got I think the last copy, last two copies. Oh my I'm God. sending one of those to the person who wrote the foreword for my book. So it's called the Happy Wanderer. Yeah, Anthony De Mello, S J, the Happy Wanderer. Yeah, a tribute to the late yeah Anthony De Mello S J. Fair enough. Interesting, very interesting. That that was the first. The second, not a serpent, not a rope. Very catchy title. Then what is it? Yeah, so that's, that's actually from one of the stories. There's a you know the standard thing where a person sees a up on the road and thinks it's a snake. But in the, when he found he found it was neither a serpent nor a rope. It was a string of diamonds. Okay, yeah, that's one of the stories in the book. But I put the stories without a moral. I remember a French uh, author who was ready to translate the the this book into French. When I asked if she would translate this, she didn't quite agree with uh, with my philosophy. So I said, "That's okay. You don't have to do it then." But I was very uh, strong. Even now, when I get a book, even a story on WhatsApp. I edit it. I remove the moral or any lesson or sermon, as we call it. I remove that and send just the story. You make of it what you what you want to. So, Cliff, uh, you have traveled all over the place and uh, have influences from all over the world, including uh, Burma and Pune and all that. Tell us, sorry, Burma and Belgaum. Tell us a bit about those things. <laughs> Actually, I'm influenced by from by Burma only. How do you say by osmosis? I I've never been there. Uh, six. Uh, there are nine children. Six were born in Burma. Uh, five were born in Burma, but I was born after Dad retired and came to Belgaum because of our studies. That was the reason he came to Belgaum. But this Dad had the interest, and then he was 60s. always telling us stories. Sixties or fifties? Uh, yeah, I was born fifty-one. So yeah, he yeah. he came soon after the war. He came. He retired and he came to to uh, Belgaum. But he was—he had sent the family ahead from from Burma, and he got caught there. He was actually—he had got a commission in the short service commission in the British Army. He was the British Telegraphs, so he got a short service commission as second lieutenant, then lieutenant, and he also made it to captain. But he was one of those who trekked. You know, you yeah. mentioned you've got La Saligo people, Ivan, and all those. I think the whole family trekked in their case, but Dad was alone. Fortunately, the family was already safe in Belgaum, so uh, we would always get Burma stories. You know, Burma story. There were a lot of Burma stories, so that's the influence of Burma on me. But there are two of us, my sister and I, who have never been to Burma. And when she went to Thailand recently, uh, this sister of mine, there's an elephant ride. You know, with a bridge over the river Kwai. That's that's yeah. uh, that's there in in Thailand still. So the elephant. They went on an elephant ride, and then they told her this is the Burma border. So she requested the mahout to take ten steps into into that and come back, so she could say that she also had been to Burma. But I'm the only one who hasn't been. I see. Yeah. I see. Yeah, Belgaum was, you know, is what is what they call a one horse town. I believe your own mother was there. Or was she in Hubli? She was in Belgaum both as well. Belgaum and Hubli, both. Both. Okay. Both. Okay. It was a so railway center. Been... It was a railway center. Many people went there for education. Yes. 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 Darwad also. Yeah, and lots of Anglo Indians. So many of our own people changed their names, you no, know, to Smith and Ferns and stuff like that because True. you had a better scope of promotion if you were Anglo Indian. In the railways. In the railways. Yes, in the railways. In general, in British India, it was like that. But Be Belgaum was a one-horse town. Yes, everyone knew yeah. everybody else. I see. Anybody who was anybody went to St. Paul's School or St. Joseph's Convent. 
this and is even now camp, when St. Paul boys meet, camp, it's camp, yes. No, no, yeah. we had people from all over, but we always knew okay. everyone where they lived. And you were always identified by the by a house, red, green, gold or blue. So with Joe Gomes, oh, Joe Gomes was in red house and Rosario Cardoso in the blue, green house one. But wait, there were two. One was on Picket Road, one was near the Billet Saloon. But that's how we knew each other. You meet a bell. Uh, Cliff, Cliff, you know what I think? Any better? Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, your every every three or four minutes, your ATLs uh, or whatever you're using seems to be glitching a bit, and then it comes back to normal. Uh, so that's okay. But I've just missed the important point you were making about Belgaum being the center of the world. So, so if you could repeat that, yeah. Because, uh, Belgaum being the center of the universe. Universe. Generally, you, you, if Carry you on. meet an ex polite and I'm sure you know some of them. Of course. You know, like. You know, Agnel Remedius, Agnello and, Remedius and all this hockey, Almeida, hockey gang. Almeida, yeah. yeah. They will always talk about Belgaum as though there's no other place like it. And their school, like there's no other school in the world. It's a close-knit community. It's a close-knit community and one can understand that. Very, no? very close. Now, for instance, now everybody knows that Bennett Pace, who was on the company group, he, he, is, now the, he is now going about as the oldest surviving ex polite I mean, I that is the way we identify him. Yeah. You know? That's your claim to fame. That's your claim to fame. Yeah. Bennett Pace is the oldest surviving ex polite And, you know, people from Belgium, from St. Paul's, they have, they have played for, they have played Olympics. hockey for Olympics. Kenya and, and Canada also. Yeah. Uh, well, Canada's ex Belgium. Hubert Pereira's son was the captain of the Canadian hockey team. Right? Now, he has never been to Belgium, but the Belgomites will claim. True. You know, they claim that they claim that as their victory. The so Belgomites, his father never played hockey, I think, but he was the captain. His son was the captain of the hockey team. Yeah. Now it's uh, now the sound is fine till we go into our next glitch. But uh, before that, I want to hear about uh, Clifford and psych psychology. Clifford That's it. See. I've, I've always I've always loved psychology and counseling. I mean, from the time I was very young, and uh, so it's it's like it's like a been a passion with me. And I've always wanted to be a counselor, and that was fulfilled for me uh, when I met Tony DeMello. It was you know he saw something in me which others hadn't seen, and he saw the potential in me, and I had no. I still have very little formal training in counseling, actually, except for that one time with Tony in that, uh, I told you that gestalt therapy session, and that was just a group therapy session. I've not had a formal training in counseling. So whatever I've, I know today is something I picked up from books, practiced it till we got it right, you know, listening. And now we have YouTube, but I, when I was studying, there was no YouTube. so. You would read books like, say, Gestalt Therapy verbatim would show you whole tracks of a whole session that was taken with Gestalt with Fritz Pearls. Or take, you know, even Carl Rogers' books like A Way of Being and so on. So I've always been interested in counseling. But when I, when I left the society, there was no scope for counseling. Even now, people say, I'm not mad. I don't need a counselor, which is a completely strange uh, reaction. To be, yeah. because everybody needs counseling. Everybody needs counseling, you know, but not everybody wants it. So, or is willing to accept it. Yeah, they're not. Now there is more because now schools have counselors and so on. So, but even that is given like a punishment. No, see, if you don't behave, I'll send you to the counselor. You know that kind of thing. Yeah. Whereas uh, I, I've, I've been trying to, I don't have influence with the government or with government school, but I really wish that. Counselors would have an agenda with have preventive. You know, he had a small glitch huh. with uh, with a few with a few minutes, two three minutes every every few minutes. Uh, connection seems to be playing up a bit. Uh, sorry, you were making this point. I missed this point about uh, Goa needing counseling. Carry on. Yeah, no, everybody need, everybody can do with counseling, but. Uh, the people who come out from our colleges also they you can't help it no anything any i think any trade 
once you actually get into work, you'll find that what you learned in college didn't really was well, it's very theoretical, no? So I have very practical courses, three days, five day courses that give people the experience of how to really do counseling. I mean, like, it's like hands on. I supervise them and show them. We take examples and so on. So my that way, my courses are quite successful. And in that sense, I never thought that online would work, but actually. My work has actually increased after the lockdown I see. because we really nearly had to adapt ourselves to to online. You know, people can't be your offline. So now you get people from different parts of India and all who are uh, that, who are accepting counseling. And also we have this free service. So especially because of the lockdown, it came up. I saw I saw your I saw your brochure about the free service. What exactly yes. does it involve? What exactly does it? In involve? fact. That's, I think, maybe the first ever poster in Sashti, right? Correct, in Sashti. Yeah. We'll talk about but that we, later. But we, we offer uh, counseling from different parts of India, actually, because we've got, I've got my stu students who have finished with me. They are, they are Telugu speaking. There is, uh, uh, Kurg, you know, the language of Kur. There is Tulu. There is Kannada. There is Malayalam. So all these languages. And we have got people from Maharashtra, from Kerala, who, who have wanted counseling. Then there are students of mine who were in Hong Kong and Dubai. So they are also now giving back. You know, so that's why we have the free service. Yeah. And and you all are offering counseling in these languages to people from these regions with, with the proper Yeah, skills. Yeah. Yeah. Not people from these regions. People who speak that language. Who speak that because language. The, because you can get someone from Canada who wants something in, in Marathi. Correct. Right? Yeah. So, so the last point, Cliff, uh, could you tell us about, you mentioned sh the first poster in Shasti Kokni. I know that uh, you have a passion for this dialect. Tell us about it. Actually, I didn't have a passion for it because I always thought talking Shasti was wrong. You know, it is not the correct Konkani. Till I saw your, you know, your group, which you started. And the first day I heard Dr. Aida speak, I said, oh. You mean it's okay to talk like this? And and so I used to never talk Konkani before. I used to have a kind of you know, S.J. Borkar's book I had followed. I, it, ironically, I'm and much more called, fluent. I was much more fluent it. in Marathi. Yeah. Because I had a full year of it. So after this, believe me, the Konkani I speak now even and I write better than I speak because I remember my mother speaking. There is a slight glitch with the sound coming through, with Cliff's sound coming through. It gets sorted out by itself in, in a few seconds, but uh, meanwhile, it's causing interruptions. And he is narrating. Uh, yeah, yeah, carry on, carry on, carry on. Yeah. Now it's perfect. Freeze, I know that you know, the fish people, the fish wives talk, uh, how the, you know, the shopkeepers talk. And so that's how I, I picked up, I mean, I become fluent with, with Sashti. But that the poster is the handy work. Actually, he I sent it to him for editing. That's Alan Masquerinus. Oh. Alan Masquerinus from Valley. Alan, Alan. Yeah. I think he had a similar experience to mine where he began to yeah. see the value of speaking Sashti. And so he really speaks freely now. And uh, I think he puts all those uh, uh, this uh, voice messages and all that which people enjoy. Oh. Very interesting. So in this in this uh, talk of a little over 40 minutes, we've uh, discovered many faces of Cliff W. Da Silva, mm. uh, De Silva, sorry. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, these include being a book editor, being an author, being a co-author, being a psychologist, uh, being a Jesuit for a little while, and also, uh, also being a fan of Shasti Kokni. I'm sure there are other things which you I, I don't have a clue about, so we've not yet. One interesting it. thing that my wife says, she says there's no such thing as an ex Jesuit. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. Maybe some other time we can talk, uh, Frederick, and I'll I'll tell you about this sure. book which is coming out one of these days. Tell That's us now. Tell us, tell us now. Why some other time? Um, it's it's called Diaries of the Heart experiences in person-centered therapy. So while I explain person-centered therapy, I give practical examples of how people have been affected by one or other thing, like one or other aspect. Like for instance, I have a chapter on empathy, 
or another chapter on unconditional positive regard. And we get actual experiences of people. Of course, we can't give their names because it's confidential. So, but they actually tell you how they have been influenced by, by different, not me only. There are other counselors in their life, person centered therapists, who have influenced them or who have changed their lives and how the changes are quite permanent. So it's a kind of a teaching book, but I think even lay, lay persons would be able would benefit from that book because of the basic person centered therapy, the philosophy, underlying Cliff, philosophy. Cliff, is the field of psychology in Goa sufficiently developed or what more could be done? Well, Goa University must be the only university in the whole world which doesn't have a psychology department. I had heard that there was a there was one of the vice chancellors didn't like psychology, so he never uh, never permitted it. But I even at the college level, at the college level, who is teaching it at the at the graduate or postgraduate level? I think there are a few courses now. No, they are postgraduate, but they are all self finance courses. No, yeah, Kamal College has, Saint Xavier's has, and uh, Nirmala has. Okay, the Nirmala calls it a wellness course. Yeah, but at the college level, it's there. Every college offers a psychology, but for post graduation in counseling, there are three places in Goa. I see. But we and don't. You need. You need. You need it at the university level, where research, research and, and all yeah. will be done. See, uh, when it's a self finance course, where's the motive and motivation to yeah. even do it's your tough, doctorate? It's tough to sustain it in the first place. That's true. That's true with the self finance course. No, if it was yes. Yes, As you were asking, does Goa need psychology more than anybody, any other place you mean? Any other place? Not, or... not particularly, but everybody needs psychology. Because of the massive and social I, transformation I, it, that's I've... going on here? Because of the social transformation? No? Because of the? Massive social transformation that is uh, that Goa is facing. See, it's not just counselling that's needed. I think it should be there at the university level because there has to be research. Where is the research? And we have, we have a sociology department. Many of these problems are actually sociological problems, not psychological. And But there should be research, shouldn't there? So you need someone who has a genuine love for, for these things. Somebody who, who has the passion to, to take that forward. You know, it won't... You, you had, for example, take Konkani. I remember it, it came to the forefront after Dr. Olivinio Gomes came in there. We need someone like that. He had, he had come. He was a civil servant and then came into academia, but he had the passion. You need someone like that. Research has to be done, and that is that can be sustained only at the university level, can't it? Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Cliff. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much for all the time. I uh, I'm sorry that there were some glitches in between yeah. with the sound, but I'll have to edit the video. Uh, we've had some people watching. Okay. While I'm glad you're talking. editing because uh, if it's going live like that, it's... no, the live stuff has already gone live, so the mistakes are already there online. So people are going to grumble and they're going to pass comments saying that we didn't hear bits of it, but I'll have to drop out those bits and then we'll hopefully get together much more. And probably send it. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you so much for thank your time. You, All Frederick. the very best. Thank you very Real much. Real pleasure. Real yeah, pleasure. God bless.